Thank you very much, Bob. Let me say what a great pleasure it is to be with all of you here today. Not just because I'm in the midst of great friends and colleagues and scientists who have accomplished so much in the form of uh, Professor Mike Cohen, Jared Baton, Gina Brown, Betsy Herald, but I'm also in the midst of the person who inspired Kuresha and I to even get involved in this field. Now, you probably have no idea who I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you all guessed it. It's Zena Stein. Zena, great pleasure to, to, to give this talk in your presence. And I have to tell you, I do so with some trepidation. <laughs> because uh, I first attended an HIV center grand round. I think it was in about 1987 or 88. And I remember Anka standing in the front and sort of introducing things and saying hi to everybody and sort of getting things moving. It was one of those rooms that you entered at the back and it was long benches. And you sort of had to push people in to get in at the, at the corners. And uh, the first talk I went to, I was just like blown. Wow, this is amazing stuff. And so it became my Thursday morning regular. Not because they had some good hot tea in the morning, but also because uh, uh, I really enjoyed the science. And so I'm very pleased to, to be here with all of you and to share with you in the next 40 minutes or so, some of the science that uh, uh, we've been involved in and several of the people in the room have been involved in, in terms of thinking about pre-exposure prophylaxis with a specific focus on HIV prevention in women. So what I want to do uh, in this time, I'm going to very briefly uh, sketch out some aspects of the epidemiology of HIV in women. And I'm going to share with you some recent data that's emanating from phylogenetics that's helping us to understand a little better who is infecting whom and try and map out some of the chains of transmission. I'll then go on to talking about the effectiveness of PrEP. I'll present some of the, the data from all the different studies. And I want to touch very briefly on the challenge of adherence, because there are many great experts in this room who've looked at adherence in great detail, not least of which is Ariane van der Straten, who has just joined us. But I want to touch on it so that there's a sense of completion around one of the biggest problems we face in providing PrEP. And then I want to go on to some of the biological issues that we grapple with in PrEP. I'll share with you some new data from a PrEP implementation study that we are undertaking in South Africa. And just to share with you, you know, some of the challenges. One of those words I really hate, you know, real world challenges, like there's some artificial world challenges as well. Uh, but I'm going to share with you some real world challenges about what it's, what it's like trying to actually do this in, in practice. And I'll end off talking about some aspects of the future of PrEP, just painting it in broad strokes. And I'll uh, touch on one of the important sort of future aspects that I see, and that is sort of going beyond antiretrovirals to looking at broadly neutralizing uh, antibodies before I make some concluding remarks. So that's what's in store for you. So buckle up and <laughs> get ready for the ride. So if we look at the HIV epidemic at a glance, and I probably you know, don't need to tell anybody in this audience in these statistics. We know from the data that comes from UNAIDS that in 2015, we were in the midst of really at a point in the HIV epidemic that is a, is a critical juncture. If you look at the entire history of the HIV epidemic, we're really facing a situation in 2015, which still applies today, 
where we have about one million deaths still occurring each year from HIV and about two million new HIV infections occurring. And about 70% of the global burden of HIV in Africa and one continent. And I like to try to sort of summarize all of this in just one statistic. And that is that if one wants to think about HIV, and I hear so many people at policy level in other fields talking about, you know, you guys have now, you know, defeated the HIV problem. Well, I mean, we've hardly turned any corner in HIV if we've got 40,000 new infections occurring each week. I mean, just that thought for me sort of spells out that we have a long, long way to go. And so all this talk about having turned the corner and so on, just simply, I don't see that. And what I see is just an ongoing, raging HIV epidemic. And I think part of the reason that there's so much of optimism is because the, at a global level, we've made enormous strides from the provision of treatment. Just initiating people on antiretroviral therapy, as you see in the blue bars, we, as a global community, have been doing exceptionally well. Indeed, UNAIDS released its latest statistics on World AIDS Day, so that was, what, about five weeks ago, uh, with their new estimates that just over 18 million people are now on antiretroviral therapy. But on the flip side, oh, can we get rid of that little <laughs> bar there? It's sort of blocking my <laughs> critical piece of information. <laughs> yeah, put it on top. Or at the bottom, either, it doesn't matter, just not on the side. <laughs> okay. So when you look at any epidemic, any epidemic, whether it's Ebola or whether it's SARS or anything, you expect that as the epidemic is growing, because there are a large number of susceptibles within the population, you will see this steady increase in the number of new cases. And as the number of susceptibles goes down because they've already become infected, you will see a plateau. And that occurs in pretty much almost all epidemics. And once that occurs, as the number of susceptibles is now declining, the number of new infections starts declining. And so you will start to see it going down, the standard bell-shaped curve that you expect in an epidemic. And in HIV, it's no exception. And indeed, this downturn occurred long before there was any real scale-up of antiretroviral treatment. So as much as everybody likes to claim credit that you know, we made the difference, in truth, it was going down anyway. And we probably helped it a bit along the way. But the worrying part of all of this is that treatment, because of its huge impact on prevention, is part and parcel of helping this line go down even faster. But the estimates over the last three years suggest that we've reached a, a sort of point of stagnation. We're not seeing the number of new cases going down. And that's a worrying aspect of the global HIV situation and where we are. And uh, you know, at UNAIDS, we've had all the modelers sit down and all of the epidemiologists and try and sort of figure where we're going to with this. But there are many reasons why that is the case. And one of the reasons for that was captured in the World AIDS Day report put out by UNAIDS. And UNAIDS decided to change their normal approach. And they talk now about the sort of life cycle or life course approach to HIV. Now, for those of us who are involved in many other different aspects of epidemiology, mental health, and so on, this is normal terminology for us. But in HIV, it's, it's sort of bringing an understanding from other fields and a helping uh, understand better where we are in HIV. And this report, if you haven't read it, is worth reading. It was released on uh, World AIDS Day last year. It shows, it sort of highlights that at different stages of life, 
they are different needs. They are different risks and they are different needs. And among them, it sort of points to the fact that every day there are about a thousand new young women becoming infected with HIV. And <coughs> in the teenagers, that most of the new infections that are occurring are occurring in young girls. In fact, in Southern Africa, 90% of all infections in teenagers occur in girls. And that we haven't been seeing the kinds of reductions that we'd like to see in this young group. But this young group not only has challenges in prevention, we also have several challenges in treating this group, not least of which is to have them come forward for testing, but also when, even when we do put them on treatment, they have among the lowest retention rates for antiretroviral therapy. So th this group of young women certainly presents a major challenge. So one of the things uh, Kuresha and her team have been doing in this rural community, it's about an hour and a half from Durban. In this rural community, which is in the district that has the highest HIV prevalence in South Africa, so that gives you some idea that it's a really high burden community, we did this house-to-house uh, -house survey using a stratified random sample, visited just over 11,000 homes, and we tested almost 10,000 people. In the course of testing these individuals, we found that about 36% of them were HIV positive. And about 60% of those who were positive knew their HIV status. So this goes to speaking to the the 1990-90 cascade. And of those uh, who were HIV positive, about 42% of them were on antiretroviral therapy, and about half of them had viral loads that were above uh, 1,000. So this is a, a grave concern, that we, one of the biggest challenges we have is finding people who are HIV positive. Actually, once we find them, we're not doing too badly in terms of getting them on treatment. Part of that gap between HIV status and treatment is really a hangover of the CD4 cutoff that we've had in the past. And that's sort of steadily being uh, bridged. So all of those individuals who have high viral load, we are able then to sequence their viruses. And we are able to then link together those individuals who have very similar viruses. And we set some criteria, which I've listed here, to define which viruses we think are linked to each other and which we will term as a cluster. They've come into a cluster. So in all of these, we tested just over, uh, we've um, sequenced almost 1,600 uh, viruses. About a third of these individuals could be put into clusters, but a fair number of the clusters were only women or only men. In fact, there were a large number of clusters that were only women. It speaks to the challenge we have of finding the men because they are transient, and so we don't get them in. But we had 90 clusters, and this was you know, from really trying to search for men. So our proportion of men in the study is slightly lower than women. And in these 90 phylogenetic clusters, where there's at least one man and one woman, we then try to understand how the transmission networks were occurring. And we, uh, there are some assumptions that we have to make about directionality, and we have to make some assumptions about the fact that not all of these transmissions are direct transmissions. They could have had people in between. But looking at it as a whole, what this told us was that young women, that young women have the highest HIV incidence rates in this community. So this is women who are teenagers and women who are below the age of 25. And that most of them are acquiring HIV from men who are about nine years older. <coughs> now, when you start talking about you know, an 18-year-old or 20-year-old, a man who's nine years older is not just nine years older. That's a substantial difference. And when we look at these men who are mostly in their 30s, 
what was interesting to us was that most of them did not even know they had HIV infection. Many of them, we uh, presume, were recently infected, and many of them had high viral loads. And through this linkage, we are able then to identify uh, one of the important sources of HIV that's responsible for entering the, the community of young women. So where are these men getting HIV from? Well, one of the interesting things that emerged from this analysis is that in women who are in their 30s, the prevalence rate of HIV is about 60%. So in other words, three out of every five women in this community in their 30s is already HIV positive. These women are now seeking to find their lifetime partners, their husbands and their, their future life partners. And these women are the main source of HIV infection in the men. And the mean age difference is about one year. So when you look at this cycle, the thing that is probably quite striking is that when these young women grow older and reach their 30s, they then become the major source of HIV for the men in their 30s. And the men in their 30s are then infecting the next generation of young women. And so the cycle continues. And one of the things that helped us understand this was about 40% of the men who were linked to a young woman were also linked to a woman in their 30s. So this helped us understand that these men were the bridges, that in a cluster where you have a man in the 30s who's HIV positive, they will have a young woman with the same virus or similar virus, and they also have a woman in the 30s. So this, this network analysis helps us better understand this. Now, there are many limitations to this, not least of which, you know, we're only looking at 90 clusters. And of course, these studies become increasingly difficult to do as treatment rolls out, because the more of the individuals that you have who are on treatment, the less you've got sequences <coughs> available. So it's going to be part of the challenge is to, to continue doing these studies in other communities as treatment rollout is occurring. And it's going to become increasingly difficult in this community, because we have this huge push to roll out treatment here. So one of the things that emerged to us is that you know, we need to be putting women onto treatment. And we're certainly doing that through antenatal systems and so on. We need to be putting men. We need to be circumcising men so that we decrease their risk of acquiring HIV. Many of these men will be difficult to put on treatment because they are still in the very early stages of infection when they are passing it on. But we've got to impact also on this third group, and that's young women. And we've got to find some way for, to reduce the incidence rate in these young women. Because it's that cycle of HIV transmission that leads to this kind of picture. There are seven clinics in this community, and if you look at pregnant women in this community, by age 16, already one out of 10 is HIV positive. When you start looking at 18-year-old girls, it's now one out of five. By the time you get to 24, 25-year-olds, more than half of all pregnant women coming into each of the seven clinics there in this community is already HIV infected. So what are our options? Well, we have the traditional ABCs that I want to go through because I'm going to focus my talk now on pre-exposure prophylaxis. And try and give us a sense of what is it we know about pre-exposure prophylaxis and what is its potential to change the picture I've just outlined. So let's start with the evidence for the effectiveness of PrEP in women. So this is data on the effectiveness of PrEP in men. And these are all of the data that are available. Uh, in randomized control trials with HIV as an endpoint. And what is striking here is, sorry, this is just to explain that these are both heterosexual men and men who have sex with men. So it's both uh, uh, sexual orientations. 
But it's quite striking to see that there's quite a high level of consistency across the data, that most of these studies you know, provide protection rates or effectiveness levels in the 80s. There's one or two studies that are slightly lower. But you get a sense that generally these studies are going in the same direction, that we are seeing pretty high levels of protection in men. Now let's look at the same picture for what it looks like in women. And I'm here I'm presenting three formulations of PrEP. Oral PrEP in black, topical PrEP in the form of gel in purple, and the rings in red. And what is striking here is that let's just look for a moment at oral PrEP. That from these studies, we have a very low level of consistency. We have three arms. Th these are not necessarily individual studies. Some of them are arms within a study. But we're seeing that in the oral PrEP, it goes in both directions, the dotted line being zero. If one looks at the gel, you can see it varies from 0 to 39%. And if one looks at the rings, one sees 27 and 31%. So we're seeing low levels of protection, and we're seeing inconsistent outcomes, especially well across uh, both the gels and, and, and the tablets. So we certainly don't have very compelling evidence that we're seeing consistent efficacy, or consistent effectiveness in the intent to treat analysis in each of these trials. But when you look at it as a whole, there was enough evidence for WHO to proceed with making a recommendation. And on the whole, the totality of the evidence suggested that PrEP does work, that if people did take tenofovir containing tablets every day, that they should have a benefit in terms of prevention. And so based on that, WHO made a general recommendation for everybody at high risk. But why do we see these inconsistent results in women? What's driving those inconsistent results? Well, the first thing I want to look at then is adherence. So this is a plot of the adherence estimates based on drug concentrations in, on the x-axis and the effectiveness that was seen in the study, the overall intent to treat effectiveness in the y-axis. The size of the circle is the number of HIV endpoints in the control group. So that just gives you an idea of the strength of the evidence. So the bigger the circle, the stronger the evidence. And there's a very strong correlation between adherence, well, strong enough, 0.84, between adherence and effectiveness. It should be pointed out that the two ring studies, measuring a single point of adherence in the blood or in the genital tract is not a very good measure, not a very accurate measure. And there's certainly new data that you can look at other measures in the ring, such as the residual levels, to get a better sense of adherence. So this may not be the most accurate measure of adherence for the ring. So let's, for now, just leave the ring and just look at the gels and the tablets, and you get a clear sense of the relationship. If you adhere, or if the trial has high adherence, one sees more effectiveness. And that we see within each of these studies it is not necessarily that all groups benefit equally. And again, this comes from the Ring study. It's Jared's paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. One sees that in the youngest of the women, the below 21, uh, the 18 to 21 year olds, you can see that the two lines coalesce. And indeed, the level of protection is in minus 27 degree, at uh, 27%. Whereas we are seeing good levels of protection in the older groups. Why that might be the case is still to be unraveled and to be figured out in more, more detail, whether it's simply adherence or whether there's something else going on. I'm sure we'll hear later when Jared presents. And certainly we have seen within the Caprice 04 study 
quite an important role of adherence. And we can look at adherence slightly differently in the O4 study because we count the number of returned applicators. So we have a measure of adherence both in the control group and in the active group. Remember, the moment I sort of start talking to you about levels of drug in blood, we only have that information in the active arm. We don't have any comparable data in the control arm. So those analyses are mostly case control analyses focusing only on the active arm. But in this analysis, where we looked at returned applicators, which is in both arms, just to give you a different measure of adherence, you see the difference that we see 54% protection amongst high adherers, but only 28% protection amongst low adherers. And if one just looks at the gel studies, I chose the gel studies because the, I have the data more readily available, that the overall intent to treat analyses, and these are the comparison across the active arm compared to the control arm, you see levels of effectiveness varying from 0 to 39%. But in the same three studies, if you do the case control analysis, in other words, you look at the analysis based on the uh, detection of drug in the active arm, one sees much more consistent data, if effectiveness levels in the 50% thereof. And, in it, it, and that's consistent across all three of the studies. And these are the case cohort analyses from the three gel trials. So that gives us a little bit more comfort that adherence is playing an important role, that there's a, there's a strong relationship between adherence and efficacy, that if one adheres, one sees efficacy. So I think we, we have a level of comfort that the data point in that direction. But is that the totality? Is that the whole story? Uh, it might not be. And I think what we need to better understand is, are there any other factors that are playing a role? And here I'm going to talk about some biological factors. So let me start by just talking about something called genital inflammation. So we described in the <coughs> Tenofovir gel trial that there was a relationship between genital inflammation and whether women acquired HIV. So in each line, that's the level of a cytokine or chemokine. And you can see the names on the extreme right-hand side. Thank goodness that little line is not there blocking it. And each row is a woman. So you, you see a little block here. That's one woman. The blue blocks are women who later became HIV positive. In other words, sometime in the weeks or months after we assessed whether she had genital inflammation or not, she acquired HIV. And the yellow dots are women who remained HIV negative throughout follow-up. So that's how you can read this. And what's interesting, I, and this is just, you can analyze it through eyeballing it, that where the levels of the cytokines are high, that this section where it's mostly red, you can see that the women mostly acquired HIV infection. The, the squares are mostly blue. In this section, where the cytokines are generally normal or low, most of the women are yellow. So they have remained HIV negative. So we see this association. Now some people ask me, what is this genital inflammation? Well, you know, when I went to medical school, I remember my teacher telling me, you know, inflammation is redness, it's uh, hot, it's raised. Uh, you know, they call it all the R's, right? Red was rubro and, uh, yeah. So we learned that it would be painful and that's what inflammation is. Well, that's not what I'm describing. Okay, so everything you remember from medical school, forget that, right? That's not what we are describing. What we are describing here is subclinical inflammation. We have evidence that they are inflammatory signals, but we're not seeing clinical evidence of inflammation. And so that's what we've been trying to understand. So what causes this? Why are these signals occurring? What's responsible for this? 
So the first thing we did is we looked at the usual STIs and we found they don't really explain most of it. That they only explain about 20, 25% of it. So we've continued our search. And there's a whole separate talk I could give about what that search is revealing and some of our results on Prevotella and so on. But you've already had that talk. Brent Williams already gave that talk uh, a few weeks ago. So I'm not going to repeat any of that. I'm going to focus rather on, so what are the implications of this kind of genital inflammation? What are its implications for PrEP? So we looked at the presence or absence of genital inflammation at enrollment. So that means we can be pretty secure in stratifying based on that enrollment characteristic. And that gives us basically two separate trials. So if we're looking at women with no evidence of genital inflammation, so in other words, their cytokines are in the green zone. In those women, we are seeing efficacy of around 50% the tenofovir gel provides about 50% efficacy. Remember, I'm presenting data to you here from topical prep, from gel. This is not data from the tablets. We don't know if this will also apply to the tablets. Uh, I'd be surprised if it didn't, but we do not have any empiric data to show that. In women who have genital inflammation, if we did this trial and we screened out all women who had no genital inflammation, we only included women with genital inflammation, we would have no efficacy. Tenofovir gel has no benefit in women who have genital inflammation. That's what these data show us. We wanted to look at, so what, is, what are the characteristics of the viruses that are being transmitted? So what we found was that if a woman has genital inflammation, then the scope of the viruses that these women acquire comprises low infectivity viruses, which are green. So these, and this infectivity index is based on culture. We can look at how easy it is for this virus to cause infection, and we can give it a value. So based on that, the thing that surprised us was that if a woman has no genital tract inflammation, it needs a high infectivity virus. It needs a virus that is really able to enter cells, able to cause infection. Those are mostly the viruses that cause infection in the presence of, uh, in the, when there's no genital tract infection, in, inflammation. However, when there is genital tract inflammation, we are seeing these low infectivity viruses, viruses that will not normally cause uh, infection. So that's the first thing that sort of struck us. We've done a range of other studies as well. I won't go through all of them now, but they basically support the hypothesis that it's easier for viruses to get in when there's genital inflammation. We also show there's an increase in CD4 count. We also show a CD4 in the genital tract. We also show there's more activation of CD4 cells when there's genital tract inflammation. So I can, I can give you all of the circumstantial evidence that we've, we've accumulated that genital inflammation makes a difference. But we don't have a smoking gun yet, and we're working on that. So the evidence has been steadily accumulating, and there have been several people who've been contributing to this body of evidence, and uh, among them being Betsy, who's you know, been doing really sterling work in this area. So we could hypothesize what the mechanism is. And there's actually a nice paper in immunity from Doug Kwan's group where he looks at the way you can change the microbiome, you can influence uh, inflammatory cytokine markers, and what happens is that the amount of CD4 cells goes up. So it's thought that there are more target cells. It might be that there are more breaks in the mucosa. So there, there's, there's probably a whole range of things. There's no single smoking gun yet about exactly the main single mechanism. It's probably a combination of things. And that'll be a topic for the panel discussion today. You're going to hear a lot about this from the, the work that follows. The next is 
we wanted to get some idea of what is the impact of the microbiome, and we did this study which looked at proteomics. So we took the same 889 women from the Tenofova gel study, and again, we took from an early time point uh, a swab from the vagina, and we looked at what proteins were available. And we could, using that, we could unravel what organisms occurred in the genital tract. And what we found is that more or less women can be divided up into two groups. The first group are those women who have lactobacilli dominance. And this is a range of different lactobacilli, lactobacilli crispatus, inus, and so on. Uh, mostly, inus tends to dominate, but it's a range of different lactobacilli. And then you have these three groups where lactobacilli are, no, are not dominant, and they have a lot of diversity. They have a lot of different organisms. And within this group, you can see this purple dominates, right? The purple is Gardnerella. So the mustard color is the lactobacilli, and the purple color is the Gardnerella. So if you want to sort of broadly classify women, just based on their proteomic profile, we have lactobacilli dominant women, and we have women with higher diversity, most of whom have Gardnerella. So if you look at separating these two groups out, this is what the picture shows. That women with lactobacilli dominance, we see 61% protection from tenofovir gel. In women who do not have lactobacilli dominance, they have more diversity, we see only 18% protection. So we're seeing quite a difference in the benefit of PrEP. In this case, remember, always we are studying topical PrEP that we're seeing this difference between uh, those women who have lactobacilli dominance and those who don't. So one of the confounders that could occur in that kind of analysis is adherence. Could it be that lactobacilli, uh, women who do not have lactobacilli dominance also don't take the gel? And that's why they have those bad results. So we look at just among those with high gel adherence, we see 78% protection in the lactose dominant, and we see 26% protection in the non lactose dominant. So it's, it's not explained by the difference in adherence. And it's the same, the, the same applies for the work we do on gentle inflammation. It's not, it's, uh, adherence does not explain the differences we see. So one of the things we decided to do when we saw these results is what on earth's going on here? What is lactobacilli and what are Gardnerella doing to Tenofova? Why is it not having this benefit? So Nikki Klatt and her team based at the University of Washington did, oops, let me just get that back. And what they did was in, uh, in test tubes and looking at tissue culture, they grew these different organisms, lactobacilli, Gardnerella, and they also took as a control uh, culture with no organisms. And they added tenofovir to each of them, cultured them, and saw what happened at 4 hours and at 24 hours. And the results that we found were striking. So the black line is abiotic. So that means there's no culture organism, no lactobacilli, no gardnerella. Basically, tenofovir is a straight line. Nothing happens to the tenofovir. In Gardnerella, we see a slight decline, but more or less, tenofovir levels remain quite high. But in the, uh, sorry, with the lactobacilli. With the Gardnerella, within hours, we saw a loss of about half of the tenofovir levels. And it continues to go down over time. So what's happening to this tenofovir, and we've now done some further studies, and two things are happening. The first is Gardnerella is gobbling up the tenofovir. So it's taking the tenofovir intracellularly and locking it up intracellularly. So it's not available to act against HIV. I'll use gobbling up. You, you can understand what I mean. <laughs> Simpler, and it's a more graphic idea of what's actually going on. But to a large extent, what Gardnerella is doing, it's releasing enzymes 
that are actually metabolizing tenofova. And we see tenofova byproducts in the culture. So it's doing two things to tenofova. And there are now studies underway to look at all of the other organisms and what we're doing. And again, you're going to hear a lot more about this from uh, Betsy later on today. So let me go on and end off with the last part of uh, what I need to present. I'm going to share with you very quickly what we've learned from implementing PrEP. So we have wanted to get some idea. You've seen all of this variability with PrEP from all the different trials. So we decided, let's just put women on PrEP. And we're going to be putting about 3,500 women on PrEP. So this is the first set of data you're seeing. So from this group of around 350 women, we offer all of these women PrEP. So this is not a clinical trial. This is a service implementation study. You're coming in for pregnancy care or whatever it is, and we offer it to you. And we see that the uptake of PrEP is about 54%. So about half of the women are willing to initiate PrEP. And there's a lot of different reasons why they don't want to initiate PrEP. They worry about forgetting the pills. They don't want the side effects. They worry about their family things. There's a whole lot of different reasons. Of those who do initiate PrEP, about a third will stop taking PrEP in the first three months. And those, some of them are clinician initiated because these women are having side effects. And some of it are the patients themselves stopping the PrEP because they have you know, nausea or rash or something. It might not be related to the tenofovir, but they see it as related to the tenofovir. In fact, this just highlights for us that all of the data, you know, large amounts of the data we have on, on tenofovir side effects comes from patients who have HIV. If a patient has HIV, they have a higher threshold for what side effects they're willing to tolerate. As opposed to healthy people who don't have any condition and they're taking something to prevent a condition, they have a much lower tolerance. Any hint of a side effect, they are going to stop taking these tablets. And that's what we've learned. So we genuinely have a challenge that by the end of three months that you know, you've got something like about a third or so only of the women on PrEP. And if you want to have a public health impact with PrEP, you've got to get much better than that. You've got to have much higher coverage. Than that. So we actually, in this kind of setting, we have no idea what the actual effect or impact of PrEP is going to be. So we're going to need to better understand that and measure that at a community level. So let me end off with the future of PrEP. So there are many different options for PrEP. I'll just touch on the areas that we have a particular interest in. And uh, I've listed here forms of, well, you know, don't, all vaccine researchers close your ears because you wouldn't like to look at vaccines as PrEP. But for me, you know, it's a way of, it's, it's pre-exposure and it's preventing HIV. So I just lump them there. So broadly neutralizing antibodies, vaccines, these are immunological, biological uh, forms of PrEP. And then all of these are different formulations of antiretrovirals. And the whole idea is to increase the long-acting nature of the antiretrovirals so that it becomes less user dependent. And then there's this lone green circle, which is trying to say, what can we do about the microbiome? Well, actually, we understand so little about the microbiome and they, but there are some efforts to try and change it, in particular to increase the amount of lactobacilli crispatus, and lactin V is one of them. It's a biologically uh, engineered lactobacilli crispatus. It's available as a little tampon. And the whole idea is that you want to make women lactobacilli dominant. Within this, we ourselves are involved in two main streams of work. One is to look at, you know, is there a real impact of the microbiome on PrEP efficacy? And can we alter that through vaginal pH testing? Because lactobacilli produce lactic acid, they lower the pH. Women who are not lactobacilli dominant, they have a higher vaginal pH. So using pH testing and treating with flagell, now there are many challenges to doing this. Just diagnosing lactobacilli dominance is a challenge, and pH is one crude way of doing that only. And to treat you know, bacterial vaginosis is a, challenge, a separate set of challenges and the ability to sustain that. But that's all part and parcel of what we are studying. 
can, how many, what's our accuracy of our diagnosis, when we do treat people, how long does it last, what impact does it have. So all of those are currently underway in a, in, within the context of the implementation <coughs> study I outlined. And then we're involved in looking at longer acting formulations. And let me touch on antibodies briefly before ending off. So we have a particular interest in the Caprisa 256 antibody. The Caprisa 256 antibody has really good coverage against subtype C viruses, but it doesn't do as well against subtype B in some of the subtypes available in the US. But what's important about it is that it's very potent. It's one of the most potent of the antibodies currently available. And there are now two dozen, three dozen of these broadly neutralizing antibodies that have been characterized. So in a monkey challenge study, using two of these antibodies that both target the V2 loop, PGDM1400 and Caprisa 256, in the monkeys that were provided, were injected with the Caprisa antibody and then challenged with the SHIV, we have yet to have an infection, a breakthrough infection occur, even at the lowest concentrations. And again, you're just seeing the benefits of the potency. So we see, at least in the animal model, we see evidence of protection from the 256 antibody. But on its own, it is not good enough as a global intervention because of its lack of breadth against some subtypes, particularly B. It's actually good against almost all the other subtypes. So using some mathematical models, and this is um, work done by Mike Seaman with us, where we look at the different concentrations and we look at the coverage. So what proportion of a panel of viruses that come from all the different subtypes from all over the world, how well would these different combinations do? And the two combinations that do particularly well because you want, ideally, you want the combination to go up quickly and keep as much as possible on this side so that even at very low concentrations, you are neutralizing a high proportion of viruses. And then you want it to go all the way up to one. So you want it to neutralize all of the viruses. So the combinations of Caprisa 256 with the VRC's uh, antibody 07 does pretty well, and so too does Caprisa 256 with PGT121. And so we've partnered with the NIH and with the Reagan Institute who have these two other antibodies, and we are in the process of doing, uh, of manufacturing these different antibodies and putting them into humans as part of combination prevention with uh, neutralizing antibodies. So let me conclude. I think I've given you a good sense of from the global understanding of the epidemiology of HIV that we've got to make a difference to young women. I mean, if we do not change the current trajectory and the current high HIV incidence rates in young women, we will not change the global picture in the kind of way we're hoping. We will not achieve what UNAIDS has set as ending the HIV epidemic as an epidemic control by 2030. And so we've got, to, we've got to do better in HIV prevention. And certainly daily Truvada as PrEP is a step forward. It's much better than where we were. When you go back to you know, pre-July 2010 when all we had was doom and gloom in this field, you know, a whole string of studies had been disappointing, we actually have made enormous headway. And I haven't even touched on treatment for prevention because Mike's going to cover that just now. So, I think we, we have a sense that we have something in hand. There is a bird in hand. That bird is not perfect. It has problems regarding adherence. There may be a whole lot of biological factors impacting on this, on this uh, intervention, but at least it's something there. But it also is telling us we've got to do better. We, we need better options, and we need to find ways in which Truvada can do better. So we need to improve Truvada's efficacy. It might mean manipulation of the microbiome, but we also need a diverse set of PrEP options. We need lots of different ways in which we provide PrEP. And there are several promising technologies in the pipeline. I've given you just a sense of some of them. And I leave you on the note that, you know, for all of us who are tackling the global challenge of HIV, 
we have to see and we will continue to see the aim of preventing HIV in young women as one of the global greatest challenges in the HIV epidemic. Thank you.